Having said that, I'm we might um, kick off. Um, so good afternoon and thanks for coming along um, this afternoon. There's a few faces in here that should know what this is all about, but we're actually um, streaming this live um, for everyone out in the region that couldn't make it in today. Um, so to, to the team, um, so the Victorian Fire Risk Register is a, a product um, of the Risk Intelligence team here at um, headquarters. So at the moment, it's um, myself acting as um, team leader um, in the absence of Leah McCann, who's on maternity leave. Um, we've got um, Michaela Boucher acting as coordinator, and she's actually delivering this exact same presentation at the moment elsewhere. Um, and Alison, as well as our project um, officer. Um, we sit under John Haynes's team, under service delivery strategy. And the purpose of the presentation um, today is because we recently delivered this in Queensland. Um, and there was a lot of um, significant feedback to represent the presentation. So that's what we'll uh, take you through today. So the risk register itself is actually Victoria's first consistent bushfire risk register. So we'll take you through um, the, the presentation itself. So it's broken up into three areas. So we'll discuss the, the process, the risk assessment itself, as well as some examples of the use. So to start off, we'll have a look at the, the process. Um, the Victorian Fire Risk Register follows ISO 31000. So for those who are familiar with it, that's the International Risk Management Standard. Um, it's actually the best practice. So it's a guidance um, that all those participants involved in the process can actually follow. So our meeting structure was based around the, um, the, the structure itself. So we actually looked at our first meeting where we established our context, uh, our second meeting where we identified assets at risk, our third meeting we actually looked at the treatments to mitigate those, um, those risks on the assets, and then we, we wrapped it up in a fourth and final meeting to make sure that everything that we had identified was accurate. So that's the sort of process that we'll be describing to you today. So how we identify the risks, how we analyse and evaluate, um, and how we assign the mis risk mitigations. The um, context um, has been the key for this protest. So along with supporting documentation and having a centralised support team, that's really been it, um, highlighted as a, a key strength of the process and the outcomes that it's produced. So. Um, by having the centralised support team based at CFA headquarters, um, we've, we've actually got consistency statewide in the data that we've been able to capture. The process itself is actually municipal based, so each local government has gone through this process. Um, they've had multi-agency representatives involved um, because local knowledge can't be beaten. So you can see there that we've got a range of um, multi-agency representatives that have been involved in the process. A lot of discussions now is about bottom-up planning, that that's been the key, that you can't take anything away from local knowledge. Um, that is what's been input into the risk register with some supporting statewide information. This, um, this screen actually takes you into the mapping feature itself. So you can see from here that we've got a number of assets. They are represented by a point, a line or a polygon. So when you can see up there the, the residential area, it's represented by a polygon. So where we're looking at a large geographic extent, um, as opposed to something like a, the school or the hospital, where it's a single point address, we can represent that with a point. And things like um, transmission or road or rail, we can represent with a line. So that's, they're the spatial features that you'll see through the mapping. When we've identified a particular asset that's at risk, we need to consider um, an asset class. So there's four asset classes. When we look at something that's human settlement, it's got a life impact uh, versus economic with a dollar impact or environmental or cultural risks. Within each of these categories, the risk assessment criteria actually varies um, and there's a number of subcategories. So we group similar assets. So when we're concerned about life risk, we can actually look at all the residents um, in one category versus all the schools and the hospitals, where we've got groups of, uh, of people that are, that are at risk from bushfire. Having a look up at the, the risk assessment itself, 
We've got a range of inputs to be able to establish the consequence and the likelihood to be able to calculate our risk rating. So if we focus in on the human settlement assessments first, we go through a scenario. So if you can picture those multi-agency representatives, which are generally a municipal fire management planning committee, um, we're sitting around the table and we'll facilitate this process. So we have that discussion of FDI day um, and a, a developed bushfire. Where typically are we looking at the fire coming from? Um, in that direction, what is the threatening vegetation? And we input that vegetation into the tool. Then we look at the separation distance from the vegetation to the asset that we're assessing. And we also consider the slope in that as well. Those three inputs calculate a threat rating. Then we start to have a conversation around um, the residents themselves. So their susceptibility to the bushfire. So looking at their access and egress, um, their ability to be able to stay and defend their water supply. Um, and that conversation um, with the participants around the table will establish a susceptibility rating. Those two inputs, so our threat and our susceptibility, have calculated a consequence rating. When we do that for an economic assessment, we actually look at uh, the level of impact. So if the asset was to be impacted, would it have a local, regional or national state? And the criteria to establish that follows the PIPES model. And then we look at the recovery of the asset. So we look at time versus dollars. So on that risk matrix, we can actually look at whether it's a low, moderate or a high recovery. And that again establishes our consequence rating. Our environmental and our cultural assessments um, are actually quite outdated and they're actually being reviewed at the moment. So we've actually had support from um, AAV and Heritage Victoria to update the cultural side of our chapter. Um, and we've actually had some internal support to update our environmental chapter. So once those uh, assessment criteria have been enhanced, then we'll actually be able to spend a lot more um, time and focus on inputting those assets into the register statewide. When we consider the likelihood assessment, it is consistent across those four asset classes. So it's only the consequence that's different. When we look at the likelihood, uh, it's two parts. We look at the frequency of ignitions and the ability for the fire to spread and reach to the asset. Now, when we looked at the frequency um, throughout the implementation, we didn't have a definition and we didn't have numbers around what is frequent. So we actually needed to come back to the drawing board um, and, and build some context and some criteria so that we could have consistent results. The frequency we had to define as um, what was the best available data at the time. So we looked at uh, DSE at the time and CFA's data from 2000 to 2010 and we looked at ignitions that would result in a bushfire. So that mapping we were able to take out into the field when we had this conversation around what is a frequent fire and generally speaking uh, those participants in the room knew exactly which ignition that was from what job. So it really um, did support the local knowledge there but it gave a consistent decision statewide. The second part, the spread and reach. So again, it's that scenario base that on 100 FDI a day, if we had that ignition in that vegetation, would we expect it to spread and reach to the asset itself? So that's a yes and no question. So from here, that's when we've calculated our risk rating. So you can see there that there's five levels of the risk, uh, extreme down to the low. And there's actually a, a secondary uh, rating, which is called a priority rating. Uh, that's a, a number and letter sequence. Um, extremes go uh, 1A, B, C, um, very highs 2A, B, C and down the list. Um, this helps for those municipalities when they receive their outputs from the product um, and they have multiple extreme risks. They can actually then go back and say, well, which ones are going to treat first? Let's focus on all our 1As. Um, then move through 1Bs. So it's just another way to prioritise what action to take next. So the, um, with all that input um, information, um, there's actually a number of data layers that we actually take out and, and turn on throughout the process to support the local decisions. Sometimes we don't have all those agencies representative at the table at the time, 
um, we might only have local government and we might not have fire knowledge in the room. So we actually have all data layers to support um, what the vegetation type is, what's the separation distance, what's the slope. So that it doesn't necessarily have to rely on the local knowledge to be in the room at the time. We actually have statewide information to support that decision as well. That's also been beneficial when there's been um, differences in opinions, uh, which has happened quite often. Um, and it's, it's a way to go through and, and for actually there to be some sort of evidence base behind decisions, so for when it needs to be used later. So um, out of the, the, what we've gone through so far, that's how we're actually establishing a, a statewide data layer of the Victorian Fire Risk Register. This has been completed in 67 of the 79 local government areas of the state. Uh, 12 have reported um, that they have minimal bushfire risk and they are our metropolitan areas. Um, six of the Alpine resorts have gone through the process as well as French Island. So we've covered a lot of ground um, in terms of the bushfire risk for the state. I'll take you through some examples now of, of how the risk register has been used, um, the, the data itself. So when we look at our traditional outputs from the process, so we actually, traditionally we were there to support and inform municipal planning. So that's where it all began. So our series of static outputs, we've got a suite of uh, PDF maps, Excel spreadsheets, um, a statistics report, and those, those products have actually directly informed municipal fire management planning um, at that local level. And it's directly acted as an appendices to the uh, bushfire component of their municipal plans. It's also now being used to inform the CIRA process. So as opposed to those committees and working groups going through this again for the bushfire part, they can use this information already collated to inform that process. Moving forward, there's a, a lot more um, want and desire for spatial information. Um, and we've actually been able to create a Google Earth file. So this has been quite popular over the last 12 months um, as a desktop um, product, um, more so for management um, and agencies to be able to view statewide data as opposed to having to piece together a number of local government scale maps. It's also available on EMAP um, and through the GDL2 interface. So for those who are um, GIS minded and can create maps, you can actually load it in with um, other data um, to build up the map that you want to see. The, um, the information's also been overlaid with ABS, so we can actually draw out some uh, valuable stats. So you can uh, see up there when we look at the total population at risk. So as mentioned, those five risk ratings, so extreme through to low, we can draw out the total population that are within each of those risk rating areas. You can see that the stat for those that are just identified in extreme risk is quite high. So we're looking at 133,000 um, out of the state that have been rated at extreme risk from bushfire. If we break that down to houses, um, 67,000 houses at risk statewide, um, we're dealing with high numbers. So this can support some um, decision making, um, where, to, um, where to direct our services, um, you know, something like a um, HBAS service, how do we actually door knock on 67,000 doors? So it's something for us to start ticking over and making some decisions and where to focus our service delivery. Specifically for uh, CFA, um, we've supported in a number of areas and it, it's growing each and every day. These are some examples um, from early stages. So neighbourhood safer places. As you can see up there on the map, the blue area is a, a medium risk and there's a, a little green square in the centre of that and that is the neighbourhood safe place for that particular area. Now um, the neighbourhood safer place um, is um, options for a neighbourhood safer place are um, done by the local government. So they can actually refer to this risk information and see whether a, an option for a neighbourhood safe place actually caters for the population at risk surrounding. So you can see up there that there are three red areas which represents population at extreme risk um, and that population then can have that NSP as their uh, safer place of last resort. The community information guides, so formerly township protection plans, um, the um, 
the initial um, development of the Township Protection Plan was developed off those areas rated at extreme risk. So once that statewide list was populated, this was where the first lot of Township Protection Plans was developed. So from there, um, any additional Township Protection Plans or now Community Information Guides that need to be developed can be as requested, otherwise they always will align to those extreme risk areas. The uh, Grampians fire um, earlier this year um, was the first time that the VFR actually supported during an incident. We have a lot of emphasis on before and on planning um, and now we're starting to move into that during and after in that recovery phase as well. So the, the Grampians um, fire, we can actually see that we were able to support um, evacuation. So where there was an area identified to be at very high risk overlaid with the Phoenix and the prediction modelling, we could actually um, nominate which, which residents would need it to be evacuated in that time. This, um, this map is actually um, uh, an evaluation after the fire, so you can actually see the footprint of the fire up on the screen. You can see that those um, properties that are purple in colour, they were identified within the risk register as being very high and they are also within 150 metres of the vegetation. So they are our most at-risk properties. The coloured diamonds actually represent the house and shed loss. Um, so you can see there there's a, there's a strong relationship between where the fire actually spread, where we had identified the risk, and where we actually saw losses. Uh, VFRR has supported um, statewide agencies in their policy. So we've got two examples here. Our first one is the Department of Education. So each year we do an analysis for the Emergency Management Division of DAECD and we actually tell them which of their facilities are located within an extreme risk area and a very high risk area. So from that they can actually go through that list and determine which should be included on the bar um, and those facilities that are included on the bar will actually be closed on a code red day. Similar to Department of Ed is DHS, um, and DHS actually has um, their, stated in their clients and services policy that any facility located in an extreme risk area must do additional treatments. Some examples of where um, VFRR have been able to help prioritise um, is actually with V-Line and ARTC, so two of uh, Victoria's rail companies. Um, we're seeing, it's the time now where we're seeing a reduction in resources and dollars, and we're expected to do the same, if not more, with less. Um, and we've actually been able to do an analysis of where Vic, Vic, um, V-Line and ARTC's rail intersects or is within 200 metres of our extreme and very high risk residential areas. So what we were able to do, you can see there clearly that each point is a kilometre post for the rail um, and it, it has a unique ID. So we were able to give them an Excel spreadsheet that actually told them which kilometre post ID either intersects or is within the 200 metre boundary. From there, they can actually make the decision whether they will prioritise their mitigation um, in that particular area to reduce the risk um, on impacting on that surrounding community. Uh, the future for uh, VFRR. So in uh, August 2012, we undertook an evaluation uh, with Ernst & Young. Um, and it was actually highlighted as a, a critical enhancement opportunity to start looking at residual risk. So all that work around effectiveness of treatments um, that seems to be haunting everyone more and more. Um, how effective is a treatment um, and what, what are we doing um, and, and does it actually make a difference? So where we're spending this time and these dollars and our resources, um, what are we actually improving in terms of risk? So that's something that we need to start looking at in the future. Also at the moment, we're, um, we're probably 70% through uh, an online platform for this information. So those municipal committees that are familiar with that round table discussion, they will actually have 24 seven access to this information. They'll be able to jump in, um, make edits, uh, make enhancements or remove assets as a committee um, and, and make those changes 24 seven. They'll also be able to produce their output documents from there as well. So it'll be a more customized suite of products for, for them. 
the um, community. So we're starting to explore the opportunity to publish this information publicly, um, but we need to start looking at what this means for the community. Um, we, we hear a lot now about empowering the community, um, giving them the options and all the right tools and information to make their decisions, um, as well as to, to avoid complacency. So that's something that is um, next up for the BFRR. We're also doing a lot of work to support MFB with the development of their uh, structure tool. So when we were rolling out Victorian Fire Risk Register for bushfire, um, it was, that process was accepted um, and now the, the, the field are asking for a structure tool as well. So MFB have been endorsed to, to roll that out. So that's actually called the VBIRAP, the Victorian Built Environment Risk Assessment Process. So we'll go through that with them. So just um, in closing, there's, um, there's many opportunities to use this information. So we've only touched um, on a few examples today and we've really only scratched the surface in how wide this information can be used. Um, we're seeing it to inform service delivery um, as well as resource allocation. Uh, we're starting to look at how can it support right down to the brigade level um, as opposed to only informing statewide projects. Um, it's something that we need to start exploring not only the before but also the during and the after. So it's something to start thinking about where else we can help support and inform. Uh, it's something that we're very um, happy to um, support um, down to that local level uh, and where can we help you in supplying this information to make uh, better informed decisions. Thank you. Anyone have any questions in the room? Do you? Yes? Um, so, uh, uh, risk intelligence uh, does uh, VFRR going to be the built environment. Uh, what other uh, things are you looking to do? Okay, so the question was um, if risk intelligence is supporting into the built environment, what other um, areas that we're, we're looking at developing into? Um, the, the tool itself we actually recently have upgraded so that we can actually adapt it over to any other hazard. So it's just about that criteria and that context. We have the tool, we have the statewide team, um, so it's, it's really open at the moment. There's a lot of work in terms of risk intelligence that we can start exploring into the future. Um, we're supporting District 5 at the moment in um, taking that information down to the brigade level. Uh, working out how it can be meaningful and how they can actually use that information. So at the moment, the, the opportunities are, are endless um, and they're as they're brought to our attention. So using the risk data that we've already um, captured uh, and then using other information within CFA, such as FERS data, um, and being able to put it all together and build a picture to make better decisions. Catherine? might leave it there. So thanks for everyone for coming along and um, the information actually will be available online this presentation as well so if you ever need anything just contact us. Thanks. Thank you.